like Sony. And I don't mean the Sony that makes Bluetooth speakers. I mean the Sony of the 80s, 90s, 2000s. The weird Sony that was constantly making bizarre products, trying to fill niches that didn't yet exist. They made so many strange and impractical things, and it's always fun to look at them and wonder if they could have gone somewhere, if their weird features could have become the standards of the future. I've done that with a few of their things before, but this thing, this is different. At first glance, it looks like a laptop, and it sort of is, and sort of isn't. At second glance, it kind of looks like a camcorder, and it sort of is, and sort of isn't. Honestly, it's a confluence of a lot of my interests, and above all else, it's a Sony. That you can tell just from looking at it. Pure Sony, at the height of their eccentricity. There's no question of that. And it's very strange, it's very exciting, but very specific, and I think very impractical. And that wasn't always Sony's MO, even with their more outlandish products. Take their mini-disc camcorder, for instance, which I covered before in a video. This was an impressive achievement because it had a complete video editing suite built into it. If you want to watch that video, there should be a little link right there. Nothing else like this was ever made, ever, as far as I know. Sony tried to create a future for consumer camcorders that was much better than what we actually got, and they pulled it off. This thing works. It was just limited to 15 minutes of recording time, which was kind of useless. By the time it was possible to make this device correctly, Sony had tragically forgotten all about it. And even though they couldn't make it properly, they did it anyway, in like 1999, simply because they knew JVC couldn't. The fact it worked at all made them look like magicians to those who were paying attention. Or take the Sony Clie. It's far less radical than the disc cam, but it still captivated my imagination ever since I saw one at a Costco in the early 2000s. And when I later saw pictures of the UI online, I wanted so badly to see what these things were like. But I finally got one this year, and I found out that it's uh, kind of slow and not that intuitive. And once you get past their UI customizations, you find out most of the software is clunky, primitive, Palm OS crap. I'm sorry, Palm fans. Yes, I had one back in the day before the iPhone came out, and I thought it sucked back then, and I still pretty much do. And of course, it just has the usual Sonyisms, like despite having a compact flash slot, it won't play music off of anything but memory stick. Of course not. Why would it? I've also been told these were incredibly fragile, and I should feel lucky that mine is still working. So it seems like, compared to the iPhone, these were not the miracle, ahead-of-their-time devices that they looked like at first. But still, the Clie made a lot of contemporary PDAs look pathetic, and that's the Sony we're talking about here, the Sony that flexed. In a sense, at the turn of the century, Sony was trying to make the stuff that Apple would become known for later. Devices that felt incredibly well made, and more importantly, very expensive. But I would describe Apple's formula as seeing what people want and fulfilling it as succinctly and with as much polish as possible, while Sony was a legendary producer of gadgets. Their mini-disc camcorder had an incredibly complex interface that required you to learn entirely new UI concepts. And the Clie has this wacky little rotating camera on it and a double-hinged display in a PDA. And on top of that, it's absolutely covered in little buttons and switches on all sides to the point where you can actually forget that some of them are there. Sony's stuff was incredibly fiddly. But that's because while Sony did have mass market products like the Walkman series, those didn't target the masses as it were. Rather, they targeted a specific set, a group of people who thought of their lives as technology focused. The early adopters, the folks who filled their houses with the newest things before anybody else had them. That was this Sony's bread and butter. <laughs> Check out this press release from the relaunch of Sony Style Magazine in 1999. Sony Style Magazine champions the accelerating convergence of content and technology. Sony offers not only exciting new electronics products, but also urges consumers to sample and enjoy a seamless blend of music, movies, games, television, and interactivity. Sony style is an enriching entertainment and lifestyle experience, putting fun back into future shock. Sony style has been redesigned as a lifestyle, entertainment, and personal technology magazine featuring actual experiences of Sony enthusiasts. They took the Pepsi approach. They invite you to join a community, a culture, to pick the correct in-group, and together you'll all look towards the future instead of staying in the Stone Age like those people who aren't like you. 
and maybe that's all valid. There are several distinct groups in the world, and some of them are far more willing to make time in their life for weird, fiddly bullshit. That was Sony's stock and trade, this Sony at least. Complicated little gadgets full of buttons and features that you have to figure out. And that is exactly what I have here, but on another level. This is singular. There is nothing like it in existence. And I say that not just because I haven't seen anything else, but because it kind of wouldn't make sense for there to be anything else. It didn't really make sense for this one to exist. Of course, if anyone else did make anything like this, I wouldn't know because it wouldn't be documented on the English speaking web, much like this one isn't. As far as I know, I'm the first person to cover it in English in any depth, uh, not just an occasional mention in a timeline of the company or a one-off tweet or something. So I don't expect to do it perfect justice in one go. In fact, everything I'm going to be saying is drawn from machine translated press releases and documentation that's really very thin uh, and filled in with speculation and guesswork. So please take this all with a grain of salt. But I'm still gonna cover as much as I can because these are super rare and we should learn as much as we can while this one is here and working. So here we go. This is the Sony PCG GT1, released in, as far as I can tell, late 2000. And it isn't what it looks like. It is arguably a laptop, but not in many ways that matter. And it looks like one of those hybrids that can switch from a tablet to a laptop, but it's not really that either. What it is, is tiny. I could be wrong, but I suspect this was the smallest fully functional PC available in the year 2000. It's certainly the smallest one I've ever personally handled. Now in the mid 2000s, the UMPC market started producing smaller machines, but most of those were and are based around sliding keyboards and other weird form factors. So as far as conventional laptops go with a normal key bed and everything, I think the only thing that beats this for size might be like the GPD pocket. If I did magic tricks, I think I could palm this thing. I think it's smaller than a portable DVD player. I think it's smaller than the Asus EPC. I could list more things, but it's damn tiny, all right? Let the record reflect. It's small, but despite that, it's still a more than complete machine. So let's take the quick tour here. So from the front, uh, I can't say it's not that shocking, but if you ignore the obvious, the rest is fairly conventional. You've got a full travel keyboard, LCD display, a track point style mouse, and we'll just table all this stuff over here and come back to it. Because as wild as that situation looks, the left side is kind of more impressive. You'd think for a machine this size, they would have left something out, but they really didn't. Uh, we've got USB, which was ironically not universal even by 2000. There's a mini VGA port that can apparently drive up to 1280 by 1024. There's headphone and mic jacks. And there's even a modem and a PCM CIA card slot. It's really better than you could expect from some contemporary full-size machines. Now, a lot of this was fairly necessary for the time, but the card slot, that's extra. They could have gotten away without including that. That slot takes up something like a quarter of the volume of the machine. So it took a lot of engineering effort to fit that thing in. That right there is a flex. Continuing on, the back has nothing other than the battery, but then on the left side, there's quite a bit actually. We've got a memory stick reader, a firewire port, and TV out. Now, all of these things were optional. All this stuff you can argue is kind of necessary in this era. All this stuff, they just stuffed it in there just because they could. So already you get that Sony energy. They just packed as much as they practically could into a very tiny package and then packed some more. So we're off to a great start as far as tiny computers go, but now we come to the elephant in the circuit city. This is the Sony Motion Eye. Well, that's actually just what Sony calls all their integrated cameras, even the ones on their Xperia phones. <laughs> but this is a little different than those. Remember that Sony was a camcorder manufacturer. They made their own devices, toe to tip. And if I take this lens cap off here and compare the two, you can tell right away, this is no ordinary webcam. It has the look of a camcorder lens, of course, but there's other familial traits. If we turn the machine over, you'll see two things I promise you'll never see on another laptop. This hole in the center here, this is actually a quarter 20 screw socket for a tripod. And this little circular depression, that confused me for like a full day after I received the machine, till I realized, till I realized, that's where you keep your lens cap. Now that of course keeps you from setting the machine down on a flat surface, but that's not what you're supposed to do with it. This isn't a laptop. 
this is a camcorder. And I know you're not convinced. You're sure this is going to be the, the usual grift. This is just going to be a crappy, noisy webcam sensor from like 1996 dressed up in a trench coat so it can buy liquor. But it's not. It is far more legit. So we've waited long enough. Let's fire it up. It has a lovely little animation and a sound effect, and then a fan and a hard drive noise that never go away. And I don't know if they were this loud when the machine was new, but they're pretty bad now. Maybe my audio processing will filter it out in post. We'll both find out together. It runs Windows Me, or Windows ME, or Windows Millennium Edition. I should come up with one that nobody will agree on. The machine runs Windows ME. I should tell you up front that while this screen is only 6.4 inches across, if you can believe this, it does 1024 by 768, which had to have been a pretty absurd dot pitch for the era, and it still looks outstanding. And I'd love to show you the camera first, but there's a lot going on in this UI that you need to know about, so we gotta tour the machine a little bit to get our bearings. See, on boot, it looks pretty busy. It's got the usual internet service provider ads and manufacturer support apps, and it also looks like there's a bunch of floating crapware windows, but it's really not as bad as it looks. Uh, this thing in the middle, this is just a big product registration button. That's part of the default desktop. You can just get rid of it. In the lower right, this is the Windows IME component for entering Japanese text. So those are harmless. And the thing in the upper right, that's an essential part of the machine. See, as you're going to hear me repeat, this is not a laptop. It's a piece of portable consumer electronics. So the mouse and keyboard are not its only interfaces. There's also this little jog dial on the side of the monitor. This is sort of like what you'd find on a camcorder. You can roll up and down, and you can click it. And this dial is tied to this little window here, which is a pretty powerful little thing. At first glance, and knowing how these sort of customizations usually go with PCs, you might assume this is nothing more than an overwrought launcher, just a place to put programs to access them slowly and awkwardly and differently from every other computer you're going to use, instead of just going through the start menu. And it's partially that, but for a good reason, and it's quite a bit more. You can get to system controls like brightness and volume. Uh, it actually has a mega bass option like a CD player, which I find incredibly funny. You can switch through open windows, close windows, shut down or hibernate the machine, bunch of stuff like that, nothing too spicy. But the dial is context sensitive. So if you open the included media player called media bar, the dial notices and becomes previous, next, and play pause controls. And it sort of works with non-Sony apps, but not really. Like the jog wheel will tab through controls, but you can't really interact with them properly, so it doesn't do much good. It does, however, include some customized dial-specific apps. So instead of Explorer, you can use the mini file browser to, say, pull up a video without having to fiddle with the tiny mouse and tinier cursor. Also, there's a program called Visual Flow that's designed for multimedia. You can use the dial to explore your PC, and any folder with images or video clips will display the thumbnails in this animated cloud, very Hollywood style. Other than viewing media, you can do some basic file management, open a file in an external viewer, that sort of thing. Unfortunately, it seems like they ran out of ideas after that because the remaining dial apps are more like the wallpaper changer, which looks like Metal Gear Solid and makes loud whirring noises when you do anything. It's kind of cool, but also pretty silly, and the rest of the dial apps are similar. But after all, this isn't what the jog dial is for. It's really for operating the camera, and that's what you came here for. So let's get to it. The motion eye is mounted in this pod that can tilt up or down over 180 degrees. And I'll show you a little of why that is in a bit. And it has this ring at the front that you use for manual focus. In addition, we've got these controls over here. There's the jog dial I showed you, then there's the capture button, and then there's a zoom control. To start recording, all we do is hit capture at any time, and it'll launch the built-in software, which is called UREC Site. Weird name. It does take a while to start up, like 20 seconds, and I've actually missed some good cat videos because of it, but here it is. Now, by default, this is in still photo mode for some reason. Uh, it has three modes, uh, still, which takes 640 by 480 JPEGs, uh, long movie, uh, which is for normal hard drive based video recording at either 640 or 320 by 240, and net movie, uh, which records much smaller files intended for sending over the internet at only 160 by 120. 
Now this interface is largely designed to be manipulated with the jog dial. So we can just go down here and pick long movie. It takes a few seconds to go into that mode as well, uh, but now we can start recording. Hi, this is video being shot on the GT1. And the first thing you've noticed is that the frame rate is terrible. Yeah. So this is shooting at 640 by 480 and for some reason it only goes up to 15 FPS and I'm not super sure why. I don't think 640 by 480 at 30 would have been that much of an encoding burden for a CPU of this era and I have some ideas about why that might be but we'll come back to those near the end of the video. Now, it's not impossible to make good looking videos at 15 FPS with a little care. And I've got a demo at the very end of this video where I show you that you can make beautiful footage if you put some effort into it, but nobody really wants to shoot video at 15 FPS. Uh, and fortunately, there is another mode. Welcome back. This is 320 by 240 mode, which fortunately records at 30 FPS. We can all breathe now. And honestly, it doesn't look that much worse than the 640 mode. Like the bit rate on this is pretty generous. I think this is using six megabits uh, where the 640 by 480 mode is only using 10 megabits. So there's not that much difference. Both of them are encoded with MJPEG in an AVI container, which was pretty dang common at the time. And MJPEG looked a little bit better than some other codecs that were around back then. And in fact, at 10 megabits, if I did my math right, I think you can record something like five hours of video on this machine's 20 gig hard drive. And I think that beats pretty much any other portable recorder in existence at the time. So that's neat. I would say personally that this video looks great. The camera's biggest weakness is actually the internal mic, which I might not even be using right now in the video because it's been pretty rough in my testing. The picture itself, however, it's a fairly low noise, it's got great color, and I'd say it beats any webcam I've used from this era, which makes sense since, again, this is not a webcam. I would say that more or less this looks like a heavily compressed picture digitized from a real camcorder. That is what this is, an actual, genuine, no fooling camcorder hanging off the side of this machine, which I will now prove. I mentioned there was a zoom slider. Now on a webcam, if you had one of those, which you generally wouldn't, that would just digitally zoom the image. It would just crop it down and then scale it to the screen. But watch this. There is no webcam in the world that can do this. Not, not that you would want to do this necessarily, but this is honest to John optical power zoom. And that's a bright line that separates the kittens from the cats. Unless you want to count like conference room PTZ cameras, webcams just don't get optics like this because it wouldn't make any sense. They all just get a fixed ultra wide lens because their only purpose is to record someone who's sitting right in front of them, which this camera can't do very well. Like check this out. I have to be this far away from it in order to get myself in the image at all because it's minimum zoom just isn't very wide. And in addition to that, look at how the camera's mounted. If you had this on the desk, it wouldn't be able to tilt like this. So it'd be pointing down at like your chest or belly. I had to put it on this little stand here to use it at all. And even with it on the stand, it's all the way over here to the side. So if I'm looking directly at the machine, the camera is gonna be pointing off <laughs> to the side of me here. In order to actually point it at myself, I have to rotate it like this. And now the keyboard's pretty weird to use. And even if you were using it like that, just look at the software. It's a full screen app. You aren't going to use this while you're doing anything else. There's only so much selfie vid anyone wants to take anyway, and you'd never need a dedicated full screen program to do it. Now you can use this camera with other capture programs, but that's just not what it's for. It's not a webcam and this isn't a laptop. Sony wasn't selling it as one. They were selling it as this. I know this looks like a tablet PC, but it isn't because this screen is not touch sensitive and there's no stylus hidden away on here because you don't operate a camcorder with a touch screen. I mean, that would be ridiculous, right? Completely absurd to operate a camera with a little stylus. <laughs> Who would do that? Sony, Sony's, Sony's made this camera used a, a little touch screen for pretty much everything. It was really annoying. <clears throat> no, camcorders use dedicated controls and we have those. Notice that the inputs I've been using, the dial, the button, the slider, which were awkwardly choked up on the side of the display, are now comfortably located under my right thumb. Not really, since this power cord is hanging out the side, but the battery died, so what can I do? Meanwhile, my left thumb is over this little button pod that we've been ignoring up until now. 
And suddenly this laptop has become a piece of consumer electronics designed to fit human hands, sort of like a more boring game gear. This is how you're supposed to use this device, as we can see from the brochure. Now it all makes sense. You hold it with both hands with the lens pointed away from you, like this, and you look at the back to frame your shot. It looks a little weird, but it's really no different than the ViewCam series that Sharp sold for a decade plus, complete with the pivoting lens that makes it possible to hold the camera above or below you and still get a shot without having to struggle to see what you're shooting. Of course, in this mode, you can't reach the keyboard or the mouse, and that's why we have the hardware controls. The uh, jog dial here lets you access the various settings in the interface here, and the buttons over here give you quick access to various features, but this is where things sort of start to break down. So first, we've got two menu buttons here, uh, one on top and bottom. The first one brings up the shooting settings, and you can switch modes from here like resolution or between long and short movie, but it's awkward. Um, you can reach the menu options with the jog dial, sure, but then once you actually select one, it usually pulls up these dialogues and you can't actually really navigate through the dialogue properly with the jog dial. So this isn't all that useful if you can't reach the keyboard. And then there's a bunch of options you can't adjust from here at all. Like I couldn't find a way to adjust the white balance or focus mode without going to the Windows control panel and opening the Sony Motion Eye control panel using the keyboard and mouse. It's technically somewhere in the little jog dial menu, but even if I could read Japanese, I think it would take like 30 seconds to get there. So this seems like kind of a misfire. Like you'd think they would have gone deeper and customized the whole interface to work with the jog dial, and I don't really know why they didn't. The other menu button opens the global menu. Uh, you can switch UREC site between its two operating modes, which we'll discuss later. Uh, you can shut the machine down and you can access a few control panels, nothing too spicy. The remaining A and B buttons are soft keys, but you can't redefine them as far as I can tell. One just cycles through the still long movie and net movie modes. I don't know how often you need to do that. And the other is for switching video effects, which isn't exactly a critical shooting function, and it's a pretty clunky one. The camera offers a bunch of uh, not so typical image filters. So you've got your like invert colors, which is pretty common, but then you've also got this weird wave distortion effect and an old movie mode with film scratches and a shaky frame. This animated wave effect, which is of course completely useless for any actual photographic purpose. And this weird color plus 3D thing that I can only describe as the Velveeta filter. These are only available when you're in net movie mode, so apparently it's so starved for resources that it can't even do it at 320 by 240. Even stranger, instead of presetting a filter and then pressing A to toggle it on and off, you press A to pull up this menu, and then you have to jog through it and select one manually every time. And then to turn the effect back off, you have to pull the menu up again, go down to the None option, which is the third setting, and manually select it. So this is um, puzzling to me. Sony went to a lot of effort to design sensible controls for this weird hybrid device. This is pretty cool, and they could have made this work pretty well, but then they bound these to really absurd functions, and I don't really know why. For instance, the A button changes filters when you're in net movie mode, but in long movie where it doesn't work, it does nothing at all. It just plays the Windows ding noise. Of all the things they could have done with that, nothing, nothing was a wild decision. And given their experience with real camcorders, I don't really know why they screwed this up so badly. Now there's two other main modes in UREC site, and the second one is, of course, the review mode, where you can go through the videos and pictures you've taken and play them back. And again, this is pretty clunky. It has to load all the thumbnails for everything before you can do anything, and it's incredibly slow. But on top of that, it seems to organize your files in reverse chronological order. So the first file in here is always the last one in the folder, which doesn't make any sense. And you might think you can just roll downwards to get to the first file in the folder, but nope. You just get the ding. Instead, you have to wheel one at a time through all 40 or 50 or 80 or 300 files in this folder to see what you just shot. Again, they had made camcorders at this point that worked better than this in this exact situation. It's bizarre. 
And ironically, the third option in here is actually incredibly smart. It's a web browser that goes directly to the HTML help file. So you can actually move through this using just the jog dial. It doesn't make you fall back on the mouse and read everything about how to use this program. So it has a strange mix of very good UI decisions and pretty poor ones. Now, putting the UI to one side, the camera itself deserves a proper demonstration, uh, not just me in the studio pointing at my face. So I made one. Uh, I went to Seattle's Kubota Gardens and I did my absolute best to make this device shine. And I've got a 10 minute demo at the end of this video, which you'll see after the credits. But let's take a peek at a couple clips right now. Now I've been told that video codecs, particularly older ones, struggle with foliage, and it seems like this handles it better than the other digital camcorders I've tried, which tended to just fall right to pieces. Trees and bushes look pretty good on this. I'm also really impressed at how well it renders the sky and clouds, and I mean, that's no kind of formal test, but I, I just think they come out really nice. Now, at 15 FPS, it does, of course, handle fast motion very poorly. Uh, for any serious action, you kind of have to reconstruct the events in your head. This is definitely a weak point, and even for less busy scenes, the illusion of motion can be a little weak. When we go to 320 by 240 mode, the increase in frame rate more than makes up for the decrease in quality. So I think for most applications, you'd probably have to use the reduced resolution. Overall, I think this looks like an okay camcorder plugged into a PC capture card with the typical crushed color and dynamic range that you'd expect. There's also some really bad chromatic aberration with the optics. Uh, you can see these purple fringes on like bright edges in some scenes, and the sensor isn't debayered very well, which means that small details like branches and twigs tend to have green and purple like dots hovering around them. So it's definitely a step down from, say, a contemporary Firewire camera, but if dealing with tape transfers was too tedious for you, I think this would have been perfectly reasonable. I mean, there weren't a lot of options if you didn't want to deal with videotape. There was a Hitachi MPEG cam, which I covered in a previous video, but that thing was completely unusable. This, on the other hand, is pretty decent, especially if you were uploading the video to the web. Although I admit my perception of this could be colored by the fact that I really want this thing to be good. I don't know whether you agree with my opinions, but I think this is a genuine, honest-to-God camcorder just hitched to a fairly unimpressive software suite, a curiously underwhelming recording format, and a clunky set of controls. I think it's fair to say that Sony stopped short of finishing this thing, and that's weird. But the question you should be asking is, why build it at all? How does a camcorder benefit from having a whole Windows PC glued to it? Well, one feature is editing. This machine is clearly portable. If you wanted to record video in a studio environment, there were other options. You didn't need a special camera laptop. But if you took this out on a trip or something, the ability to edit down lots of vacation footage to a short, snappy trailer from a hotel room, that'd be pretty cool. Well, smartphone-style SOCs were in their infancy at the time, so there wasn't a lot of mobile power in most electronics, but the miniaturization of PC hardware that we see here meant that you could bring a complete editing suite with you, notionally. I mean, uh, Windows Me included Windows Movie Maker, which was more or less Microsoft's equivalent to iMovie. You could do cuts, transitions, titles, etc., but it wouldn't be very Sony to just abandon you to some OS packet. Meet Sony Movie Shaker. The name absolutely baffled me for a while until I took a close look at the logo. Yeah, see, you put the video in the shaker, you add some ice, and the next thing you know, your three film strips to the wind. This is similar in purpose to Windows Movie Maker, but it's a little dumbed down and it has a much slicker visual style. A Sony style, if you will. This offers nothing like a modern NLE. There's no multi-track editing, no multi-timelines. It's just a way to plug together clips you've shot and add a little flavor. You can replace the soundtrack with music, you can add the usual visual effects, inverted colors, sepia, and you can put in little preset animated titles. There's actually a pretty clever system for filters. Uh, you can drag them to this stack to cue them up, and then for each one, you can set the in and out points. So you can have the wacky spotlight effect appear for one segment and the JavaScript fire effect for another. It's certainly not as flexible as commercial software, but that's not what it's meant to be. It's just a way to shake up your video a little. In fact, there's a button just for that. If you just want to quickly make something to show off, all you have to do is drag each of your clips into the media bin, choose your desired mood from romantic to neutral to wilding out, enter text if you want, and hit the button to shake it. 
Movie Shaker will now splice segments of your clips together at random, applying various effects, splashing your text all over, and finishing it all off with one of five preset backing tracks to fit the mood. Anywhere from wacky party time to soft romantic tribute. This is like something you might have found on a high-end late model feature phone from like Ericsson. And I guess there's tons of apps that could do basically the same thing on Android and iPhone nowadays. And that's cute and fun, but there's a problem. This is way too expensive for that. This computer retailed for almost $4,000 and they only made 5,000 of them. This is too much technology just to make silly little videos. I said the processing power of mobile chips just wasn't enough for a full editing environment, but honestly, what we've seen here is little more than the disc cam could do a year or two earlier. Like, it just sort of sticks videos together, and that's about it. There has to be something more to this. Now, to be fair, this machine actually can run a full bore editing suite. For instance, here's Adobe Premiere 4.0. It runs just fine. It's actually fairly quick and responsive, so you could assemble an entire production on here, but why would you want to do that on a 6.4 inch screen? Sony clearly intended for you to do very little more than dash off fun, quick little clips with this thing, but are you gonna take this over to someone's house and plug it into their TV to play them back? Or like dub them out to videotape? Probably not. But there is something you could do with this that makes a lot more sense. If we go back to Eurexcite, notice that the title actually says Eurexcite for Image Station. This was a service that Sony set up in the early 2000s for online image sharing, and by switching the destination setting, any pictures or video you shoot will be uploaded there automatically when the internet becomes available to be shared with friends and family. And of course, if you shake up a video, you can upload that too. Show your friends a cute little 30 second sizzle reel of your weekend or vacation or whatever. Now mind you, the only connectivity this machine had was the modem, so you were going to spend a very long time uploading, but still, things start to make a little more sense. Buying basically a $4,000 Ericsson feature phone without the phone wouldn't make any sense, especially in the pre-MMS days, but being able to go out with this device that fits in a tiny carrying case, shoot video, then edit it at a coffee shop and upload it as soon as you get home to show off to friends, well, it never would have been my scene either way, but if I was a rich person who spent all their time socializing, it would probably be dope as hell. So we're creeping closer to the light, but we're not yet where Sony wanted us to be. This machine can do all those things, and they were neat and special, but they're all bonuses. This machine was made to serve one specific purpose that we haven't seen yet, and it's time to talk about it. Along with this machine, Sony introduced a new service, Percaz TV, short for Personal Casting TV, and as you might have guessed, uh, it was an extremely early, maybe the earliest, video streaming platform. Now we had video calling apps like NetMeeting in the year 2000, but those were more for face-to-face -face communication or small conferences. There was nothing like Twitch that I'm aware of. But in 2000, Sony built a large-scale streaming video distribution network called Cast2Drive, and Percast TV was a service riding on top of it that aimed to do what Twitch does now to enable individuals and businesses to live stream video to a wide audience. Examples from the press release suggest you could broadcast your wedding to friends who couldn't attend, watch 
club events you missed, and enable new means of communication between families, schools, and clubs. Let's be real, uh, had this taken off here, all of that would have meant churches. If you don't know this, the worship market is an enormous buyer of AV equipment. Uh, the Mormon Church actually built their own webcasting network before any of the modern streaming services existed, and religious service webcasting is an unfathomably massive industry. Tons of churches have complete multi-camera systems, and every manufacturer now has a dedicated house of worship division on their website. So had Sony pushed this product in the United States, you can bet that's where most of these little laptops would have been found. Maybe things are different in Japan, but one does wonder what the reality of individual streaming would have looked like. Let's consider the following. Back in 2007, one of the first successful video streaming sites, Justin.tv, was launched solely as a platform where Justin Can could broadcast his entire life in real time, uninterrupted, for everyone to watch. Sort of a real world and consenting version of The Truman Show. Before long, they opened up the site to the general public, who were encouraged to life-cast themselves. And some did, but of course, topic drift happened, people started doing other things, and just a few years later, in 2011, they took the then-enormous gaming category, split it off, and named it Twitch. Of course, Justin.tv is now long gone. It stuck around for a while before being subsumed by the popularity of video game streaming. And while Twitch still hosts lots of non-gaming content, statistics suggest that it's less than half and possibly less than an eighth of its total catalog, depending on how you interpret all other video games. Now, this next part is not meant to suggest that video game streamers don't work hard, uh, maybe harder than I do. I've done one 12-hour stream that almost killed me, and I think a lot of these people do those on the reg. But the advantage of playing video games in front of an audience is that you're provided with a sort of ever-present conversation prompt. And on top of that, it's something you're very familiar with and might have been doing anyway. So in a sense, life casting kind of did happen after all. Certainly people find plenty of things to talk about other than the game they're playing, but it provides a baseline that you can fall back on if you have nothing else to say for a moment. And that, in my observation, is why the 2010s streaming explosion happened. For every person who can program, schedule, and carry a talk show, a cooking show, a variety show on their own, not to mention people who can actually get the spaces to make those sort of things, to build sets and whatnot. There are countless other people who aren't up for taking on a dozen jobs like that or just can't get a studio space. Organized live shows are not for the faint of heart, but it's easier when a chunk of your content can be essentially media commentary, which an awful lot of people are decent at. In a nutshell, most people aren't really up for making their own quote-unquote television shows, and the modern streaming landscape exists largely because video games provided something between a leg up and a running start, so without that bolster, I wonder exactly what people were likely to live stream in 2000. Since there's no options on here for switching to multiple camera inputs or for casting the contents of your screen, you're stuck with nothing more than just this one camera. So you'd be limited to fixed single camera type shows. And I wonder what people did within those constraints. I tried my best to find out what Percast TV was actually used for, but it's tough. Uh, this is so far outside the bounds of what the English speaking web normally pays attention to. And it was so long ago, 21 years, that there's just nothing out there. Google, internet archive, news group searches, they don't turn up anything. Maybe the info is buried in some Japanese magazine or forum, but it's all beyond my reach. They had a website for Percast TV, but it was flash-based, of course, so Internet Archive failed to capture almost all of it, except for a homepage with very little useful information. There was no about, no documentation, and the only other page that was archived seems to have been like a flyer for a specific show. Now, for what it's worth, this show didn't sound very twitchy. Uh, it sounds like a very formally planned and choreographed performance of some kind, including a band with the most incredible name I've ever heard. Return the tray here. From this and a few other scraps of info, I think that Percast TV may have been two different products. First, a set of public channels visible to everyone to which performing groups could apply for time slots. In other words, public access television at internet scale. A cool idea I've always wanted to build myself. And second, a set of private broadcasts viewed by invitation only. In both cases, I think you had to apply for time slots probably due to limited capacity since this was before the days of massively parallelized computing and enormous data center pipes. Sadly, I can't verify any of that. Almost total speculation. 
Uh, I do have a quote from a magazine, however, that says that Percast TV billed about 1,500 to 8,000 yen per 10-minute broadcast slot, depending on the maximum number of concurrent viewers, and the streamer paid all the fees, not the viewers. So that's about $1.20 to $6.50 per minute, which actually seems fairly reasonable, all things considered, given that bandwidth was much more expensive in the year 2000 and most people were still paying minute rates for dial-up. This wouldn't have seemed too outrageous. Now, as for the technical details, it's uh, pretty straightforward. To start a live stream, you just go to the menu and switch UREC site over to cast to drive mode. Now, this comes up to a web interface, and apparently this would have defaulted to the Percast TV website so you can see when your time slot reservation was coming up. Then once you got there, you would just switch to the casting mode. Now, since Percast TV is gone, I don't know exactly how this would have worked, but as far as I know, you would have just pressed the capture button to go on air. And that's pretty much it. The only other difference here is the effects. For some reason, there's a bunch of effects that aren't available in the normal recording mode, and they've also altered how the UI for them works, and it makes a lot more sense now. The A and B buttons are now both effect triggers, but they pick effects from these two different columns. So you actually pre-select them like you'd expect, and then you press the buttons to fire them off. Now, the column A options are all one-shot video clips that overlay on your stream. So if we pick happy birthday here, it just overlays this and then goes away. And there's a bunch of them in here, um, a lot of which don't really make a whole lot of sense. I don't know what that's supposed to represent. I'm not sure what this terrifying flame mask is. Uh, we do at least have an explosion. Giant bomb would, would have a field day with that. All the B effects, however, are continuous. So you enable one and then it stays on until you turn it off. Although you can roll through the list and pick another effect to jump directly over to. This actually makes a lot of sense. This is far more intuitive than the other mode for the interface, which kind of makes me think that they really designed this and then sort of half-ass converted it for local recording, which would kind of make sense if this was intended to be a streaming device. And as far as I can tell, that's pretty much it. Since you can't switch cameras or do title cards or anything, there's nothing like OBS Studio going on here. You're either broadcasting or not. So I think you've seen everything this can do since most of the functionality was in Sony's network service, which is gone. But there are some intriguing details about how you might have connected to that. Cast to drive streams were limited to 160 by 120 in the real media format, which was popular for streaming back then. But it's not clear to me what bitrate they used. Sony's brochure says it required 64 kilobits of bandwidth, but I think they were just playing it safe. Uh, a review I read claimed there were much lower bitrate options, although at that resolution, I think you really needed all the bits you could get. And well, dial-up, which was the most common form of internet access at the time, can barely manage any of those, especially after you include network overhead. And it certainly can't do 64 kilobits, so I think it's safe to assume that you would have wanted, if not needed, broadband. And that wasn't all that common at the time. I can't speak for Japan, but in the US it was pretty dire. Um, I had DSL, but very few other people did, and it was pretty pricey. I know in Japan it wasn't exactly universal either, but from what I understand, which isn't much, there was much better availability of ISDN. That was a digital telephone service that was uh, basically more popular in every other country than it was here for nebulous reasons. It provided two digital channels that could be used as phone lines or as 64 kilobit data channels or bonded into a single 128 kilobit channel, providing a sort of proto-broadband. That was more than double the speed of any dial-up connection and more than enough for cast to drive. So the aforementioned article recommended it, but it also suggested you might use something called PHS. I had to look this up. I had never heard of it. Apparently in Japan and a few other countries in the late 90s, there was a very strange kind of cell network called the Personal Handy Phone System, which provided mobile phone service and, starting in 2001, data service with speeds of about 32 kilobits per second. That wasn't amazing, but it beat out the pathetic speeds of 2G networks, and if the bit rates in the article are to be believed, it would have been enough for mobile percasting. And in fact, another article says that they were able to broadcast for about 40 minutes on one battery charge, despite needing to also power the PHS card. So this apparently did work. So this answers a big question, which is, why is this thing so portable? Sure, if, if it was just a fancy camcorder, then the size would make sense. You know, the smaller the better. But if Sony really wanted this to be a streaming base station, which they seem to, then small size doesn't really help matters. 
Unless, of course, they wanted it to be a mobile streaming base station. In true Sony style, they predicted capabilities we wouldn't have until the 2010s. Even without our now ever-present LTE, you could take this little machine out into the world and walk around recording someone shopping with hot fashion commentary or doing acrobatics in the city center and live stream it wirelessly to an online audience. And that is smoking hot. Sony tried to kickstart the internet streaming revolution, again in true Sony fashion, just a few years too early. If they'd waited just a little bit, maybe like Lonely Girl 15 would have started life on one of these. But since they jumped the gun, they missed their chance at a significant role in internet video. Or not, because a couple years later, in about 2004, the Sony Anycast came out. Also basically a specialized laptop, uh, which had similar capabilities to the highly successful NewTek TriCaster. Basically a portable, all-in-one, live video switching and processing system that didn't require a van's worth of support gear to do a live video event. And it, too, was capable of direct webcasting. And sure enough, those did end up in churches. In fact, it's the first thing Sony suggests in the brochure. I don't know if any of the work that went into this thing really had any effect on the design of the Anycast. And I'm not sure how popular those things really were, but they sold a damn sight more than the GT1. And I think that just speaks to the recurring truth of video in the 2000s which was that it was pretty much only open to serious professionals willing to put in the time and effort. Since the GT1 didn't pan out and the services are long dead, all you really have left here is a weird little PC. I can't really tell you much more about its streaming career other than that it existed and much earlier than it had any right to. But there are a few other things we should talk about even if they have nothing to do with that angle. First, let's talk about the rest of the hardware, since I kind of skipped over it, uh, and I'm still going to skip over the CPU. I'm not ready to talk about that yet. Suffice to say, it's contemporary with the Pentium 3 machines of the era. This thing has 128 megs of RAM, and that seems to be stock. Uh, there's a cavity on the bottom, which I believe is a proprietary RAM upgrade slot, and that's empty. 128 megs was not incredible, but it was actually on par with some desktops, like Gateway's whole advertised lineup. Now, the hard drive in this thing is kind of impressive in how normal it is. You might have assumed, like I did, that it was one of those sub-miniature ones that you find in old iPods, but those weren't around yet. The 1.8-inch high-capacity hard drive that was invented by Toshiba didn't hit general market until 2002, although I think Apple got an early line on them for the iPod. And that means that this machine actually has an ordinary 2.5-inch hard drive in it, like you'd find in any other laptop. I haven't had this open because I didn't want to break it, but I can't imagine how they fit one of those into this machine. It's like more than a quarter of the total volume. It's astonishing miniaturization. Needless to say, this machine has no CD-ROM. I mean, where would they have put it? But Sony made an external one, which connected via PCM CIA. That's this guy right here. It's probably half the reason that slot existed on there, given that CDs were essential hardware still. The other half would probably be like Ethernet cards, that sort of thing. Now. Funny fact about this, I didn't even know this drive existed when I got this machine. I, I had it for a while, I had no idea there was a CD-ROM available for it. But about six months ago, I was at RePC going through some bins and I found this and I just thought, eh, that looks useful. Brought it home, threw it in a box, never took another look at it. But then while I was working on this, I got to thinking about it. I'm like, sure, I've got a drive. Went and dug it up. This is the exact one that was supposed to come with this system and it works perfectly. I actually used it to load up Linux in order to image the hard drive very slowly onto a USB stick. Uh, and I then put it up on Internet Archive if you're interested in checking it out. Although most of the software refuses to run on anything other than this machine. As far as graphics go, the GT1 has a surprisingly good GPU. I kind of expected it to have the most basic video possible, but this was a $4,000 machine. And also, if you want to drive an external monitor, you sometimes have to go for an overpowered graphics chip, even nowadays. So for one or both of those reasons, this actually has a 3D accelerator. It's only a Rage Mobility M1, which was far from exotic at the time, made its way into plenty of crappy Celeron machines, but it actually runs Quake 3 almost playably at 1024, and at 640x480, it goes like a hot damn. I mean, it's maybe 30 FPS, if that, but that's all I ever got back in the day. First time I ever saw 60 was probably 2010, so I got real used to playing games like this. I could actually get kills at this frame rate, so honestly, the gaming experience on here is not half bad. I mean, the speakers are nice and loud, surprisingly, and the display looks fantastic despite being very, very small. You know, you would have wanted to use an external mouse, of course, but those weren't terribly expensive at the time. So as absurd as it sounds, if I had one of these back in the day, I would have gamed on it. I didn't try UT99, but I bet it runs even better. 
You may be wondering about the keyboard. Don't worry, there's no magic here. It's totally unusable. It would actually be better if they'd gone with uh, tactile switches with little pips on them, like this, because this doesn't work. Conventional laptop keys are designed to make touch typing work despite having a compact design, but touch typing is impossible on this. I know my hands are larger than average, but the reviews on this were terrible. Uh, one review called it cramped and stressful. They went on to say there was no reason to buy one of these unless you wanted to live stream and instead suggested you buy the contemporary PCG C1, which was the same size, but used more of its real estate for the keyboard. Lastly, on the hardware front, I'm really curious how this camera actually works. I mean, on any modern PC, it would definitely just be a USB attached webcam and a chip, but on this one, I'm not so sure. I suspect and would love to confirm that this is a DV camera running over a hidden Firewire connection. And in fact, when I got the machine, I had high hopes you'd be able to use this as a DV camera by just plugging a, a tape deck into the iLink port, but no dice, it's just a normal PC Firewire port. Uh, the capture appears to come in through a custom PCI capture device, so I can't tell how it works, but given that it displays blue for a few seconds after you launch it, I think it's possible that this is DV internally with a little standalone camera module that it just controls remotely. All in all, this machine has specs that are not breathtaking, but are surprisingly uncompromising, which again is not shocking given its price tag. You are paying for the nearly impossible, and Sony delivered. So the only remaining thing here is the pack-in software, which is interesting because of how general it is. Very little of it is related to video, and there's a ton of it. I think it's the most heavily loaded manufacturer image I've seen in my life. First, we have to get the ISPs out of the way. In the US, we got drowned in Earthlink and AOL offers, but apparently in Japan, the fever pitch was nearly lethal. There are no fewer than nine ISP ads preloaded on this machine, and some of them are wild, like, this one that just does this when you start it. I clipped it for content ID, but it has like five clips of this song in here. So those are weirdly aggressive. The only other video related apps on here are DVGate for controlling a DV camcorder and capturing video from it, and Smart Capture, which is a generic app you can use either with the built-in camera or any normal webcam. There's also a commercial grade word processor, a digital image organizer, and a CD ripping and cataloging app similar to Music Match Jukebox. There are a couple extremely regional apps, a Japanese zip code finder, an app for finding train schedules, and a live translation tool. There's also a fully 3D map and navigation app with the incredible name NavinU that used a Sony GPS, which I of course don't have. It's a lot better than contemporary map software that I've used. Uh, I would have expected it to need to pause to load data from disk as you move around, but it's actually remarkably smooth. There's a few other tiny things like a program called CyberCode that lets you make little QR code-esque labels. Which you can scan on the camera to launch apps and whatnot, very gimmicky. Uh, and finally, there's Community Place, also known as Sapari, uh, which is an online social space that Sony created, which used Vermal Virtual Reality Modeling Language, or VRML, or Vermal, to allow users to interact in cute little 3D worlds with animal avatars. Now, the remarkable thing about all this software is just how much of it is first party. Almost all of the above were Sony developed programs with a consistent custom visual style, which is a remarkable amount of effort for throwaway pack in software, although I suspect a lot of those programs got included on other VIOs as well. And with that, you've heard just about everything I know about this machine, except what's wrong with it. This device hits so many fascinating chords for me. It's a merger of PC and camcorder. It's incredibly small. It's from my favorite period in consumer electronics history. It's a Sony, and it even has a tripod socket. But it actually manages a double hat trick because the final weirdness is the CPU. It's a bizarre, forgotten little disaster called the Transmeta Crusoe. Someone's gonna comment and call me an asshole for describing it like that, but I remember these things being roundly mocked by the entire press, and I always wanted to get one just because it sounded so bad. Now that I have one, I can confirm, it sucks. Specifically, this is a Crusoe TM5600 running at 600 megahertz. A little slow, but still a respectable clock speed for the era, but everything this machine does, from booting to opening Explorer to anything related to video is sluggish at best. I mean, 
Opening the camera takes so long that I've missed tons of shots, and I've never been able to play back a video file at full frame rate. I mean, I, I can't even list it all. It's just everything. It feels like an early P3 Celeron, maybe even a P2. It just drags. And I suspect that this poor performance is why it won't do 30 FPS at 640 by 480. I think Sony tried, and they found out the CPU just couldn't handle the encoding, probably too late in development to walk very much of this machine back. So they just cut the frame rate in half and released it as is. Now, it's not so bad in some programs, at least once they're fully loaded. And like I said, I was astonished at how well Quake 3 performed, but that game was a masterpiece of optimization in the first place. It's possible that the spinning hard drive is to blame, but I don't know. I don't think so. I've logged hundreds of hours on old laptops with older drives, and this one is still just dreadful compared to any of them. And that fits, because the Crusoe was notorious for poor performance. At the time, I remember it being blamed on it having no native architecture. It's a very strange chip. It runs microcode that makes it behave like an x86 or a PowerPC or even a native Java device. Uh, now that part is a fact, but if it is or isn't the reason it's slow, I couldn't tell you. It is, however, a very strange choice for competition. The overwhelming majority of x86 compatible CPUs have been made by Intel or AMD. Uh, in the 80s, there were a few other clones, but as we moved into the 90s, those pretty much dried up and things really became neck and neck between those two companies. But in the late 90s and early 2000s, there was a brief period where competition suddenly reappeared for just a couple years. The uh, Cyrix, uh, the Centaur Windchip, and the VSC3 all gave it a shot. I might have my years off, but it's, it's close enough. In sort of the Pentium to Pentium 3 era, there were a few companies trying to get back in the game. And none of these were great chips. Uh, despite trying their best to outdo the CPUs from the major brands, they all failed dismally. And then the Crusoe came out of nowhere with a totally left field design that had no chance of competing. Its primary selling point wasn't performance, it was just a claim that it would use less power and enable smaller, thinner laptops with longer battery life. Uh, but even so, the performance was atrocious. For what it's worth, the ASCII review did say they were able to live stream for over an hour on a single charge, which is pretty impressive. But as a Nantech put it very succinctly, if a CPU uses half as much power but takes twice as long to do anything, what have you gained? And the rest of the review says the chip was pathetically slow, just as we see with this device. This chip isn't even fully functional. Sony issued a notice that a bunch of GT1s were made with defective Crusoes that would cause the recovery CD to fail to install, more or less bricking the machine. That sort of thing was more common in those days, even with Intel and AMD chips, but it still really caps off what a disappointment this thing was. All the same, it was a fascinating moment in computer history, and one that's unlikely to ever be replicated. A new CPU manufacturer? I doubt it, ever. As time goes on, opportunities for new hardware competitors come rarely, to put it mildly. The graphics card market, for instance, had a dozen major competitive names in, say, 1997, but for the last 20 years, every successful GPU has been made by AMD or NVIDIA. See, that's why I'm gonna buy an Intel GPU when they finally come out. Not because I need one, but because it's the first time anyone has tried to do something different in literally decades. And I want that box on my shelf another 20 years from now so I can drag it out and gleefully tell the story of the time that Intel tried to break the giant's stride. And hopefully soon we'll find out how my story is going to end. I couldn't get a Crusoe back in the day, but I always wanted one to put on my shelf because it was fascinating. A ridiculous attempt that was never going to succeed and one that came with a problem from an absurd angle. And maybe that describes this Sony too. Sony was brilliant to imagine a world of commonplace video streaming by casual home users. They foresaw what was coming, what we now know ended up coming, and keeping with their usual philosophies, they tried to create it before the technology was really there. But like Transmeta, they decided to disrupt conventional television in the most ridiculous, unlikely way possible. A phenomenally expensive device, insufficiently task-oriented to be a good video platform, nor particularly usable as a PC. And that's what confuses me. As a Sony-style gadget, I understand this. We have a 30-year history of companies making uselessly small laptops and selling them purely on the basis of their size. So Sony was showing off their miniaturization. Very cool. But they could have made that flex on its own without combining it with their would-be everyman stream box. 
As a tiny computer, the GT1 is a wonderful little gadget, other than its speed, and it would have sold for the same stratospheric prices, probably in the same quantities, without the camera. And the camera, with its associated software and network platform, would have benefited in all kinds of ways from being in a larger machine. A conventional 14-inch laptop would still have been usable for many of the same things, but would have offered a bigger viewfinder, longer battery life, better performance, more practical UI, and so on. But Sony didn't make anything like that. Just this. Cast a Drive only lasted a couple years before being incredible journeyed in 2003, leaving this machine orphaned, but it really always had been. Other than the GT1, I don't think Sony made anything else that could stream on Percast TV, although I admit the language barrier makes that kind of hard to confirm. So was it a serious effort? Did Sony really want Percast TV to take off? Did they really build all that infrastructure, you know, get a building, employ staff and everything? Maybe even, as I suspect, bring in artists to create shows on this new network, all just to promote this thing? Or was the network the flex? Is that what they were really showing off? And if so, why anchor it to one device? And why this one? I don't know, and I probably never will. But with just the information I do have, this is going to be one of my favorite gadgets for probably the rest of my life. It's going to have a place on my shelf forever because it's weird, and weird is all I want. But before we part ways here, I will show you what I think it could have been used for in its heyday. There's about 10 minutes of footage from Kubota Gardens after the credits here, and I really think you should watch it. I'm very proud of it, and I'm proud of what beautiful work this device can actually do despite everything. So I hope you like the way I told this story, um, despite or perhaps because of my embellishments. Uh, but remember, this is half speculation. So if you know better about any of this, feel free to comment below. And please don't repeat any of this as fact without confirming it yourself better than I did. But if you enjoyed this, consider subscribing. So I know you're into this sort of thing. I'd appreciate that. Remember to turn on notifications if you want to find out when I upload new stuff. And if you really like this, consider supporting me on Patreon like these folks here. I couldn't have afforded to import this thing from Japan or to rent this studio to show it to you without their help. So I'm very grateful to all of them and everyone else. Thanks for watching. extremely slow the process is just like I've been standing here for over a minute trying to get my camcorder ready to go now I have to wait for it to go to long movie mode there's a duck down there I'm missing All right, here we go The white balance is terrible. <laughs> um, we need to see if there's anything I can do about that. Where is the camera configuration from here? Uh, but I have to get out of the program. That's enough. I think I just turned it off. You stop recording for a moment. Now we're recording in 6.40, fine.
really hard to use it with the power cable sticking out the side. Uh, I don't think Sony envisioned that being possible in 2000. Let's do a small clap, don't scare the fish. Yeah. Big fish be like Tilting with the tripod is difficult because it tilts up. The screen tilts as well. Here. The white balance seems to be suffering, but then we're in the Pacific Northwest during spring, so it's not like we were going to get any actual sunlight. That wasn't in the cards. All the same, uh, I think when I get home and check this footage out, I'll be pretty pleased with it.